Welcome to the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension Connection. I am your host, Jerry Buck, and today we're going to have three separate conversations. Uh, first, about a community partnership with our master gardeners. Uh, we're going to talk about how to stop and control hypertension, and we're ha we'll have a discussion about the mini society uh, helping kids to become more business-minded and entrepreneurial. Uh, but first, I'd like to welcome Ann Edmonds, who is the Master Gardener Coordinator, and Zachary Delbex, who is the CEO of Repurpose America. And you guys must be the partnership uh, between Master Gardening and an organization here Long in town. What is, what is it about? What is the partnership? Well, I guess we met back in, right after you started, uh, Repurpose America in early 2008 when the Master Gardeners were planning our 2009 International Master Gardener Conference. And uh, at that time we were in dire straits because the economy had tanked and people were not registering for our conference so we didn't have a lot of seed money and all of a sudden we heard about this wonderful group that would give us all this great stuff for free. And, and this is this is repurposed recyc America. recycled things? Is um, that, uh, is that yeah. what what we do is uh, we capture non-recyclable materials, um, divert those out of the business um, industries within Las Vegas. So as uh, recycling is, is specific to cardboard and plastic and so on, yes. there's, there's many items that are not recyclable that often are reusable or unwanted. And so we work to divert those materials and uh, facilitate them back into the community. I have to ask, how do you, where do you intercept these these items that are not recyclable but reusable sure. where, where do you get them sure so um, my experience uh, I grew up in the convention industry here in, in the hospitality industry here in Las Vegas and watching this industry that drives our city um, I watched the uh, the kind of um, opportunities that presented uh, the the model which actually in, uh, presents problems for the industry um, and that's the the stream of materials that have to uh, exit the building so that we can get the next show in and so uh, we really target that that material stream to be a resource for our it was amazing to me when they first told me that for a lot of conventions here in town that it's cheaper for them to leave their entire displays the partitions and all the exhibit just materials away. just leave it it's cheaper than sending it home shipping it home no person power or anything so, I mean, they leave everything, including pink flamingos. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that was from Is a recent right? conference um, of landscape exhibitors. But um, they leave, if you have a conference, they leave all the bags, um, the badges, the display boards, um, pla plants and things like that. Yeah, so you negotiate this with the organization that's having the conference so that they know you're, you don't have to sneak around and, and take <laughs> stuff off the tables. You so, so the goal is, is, is uh, sustainability in, in terms, sure. and, and as we know, sustainability is, uh, is bottom line driven in a sense where if it costs more money, uh, if, it, if it's an expense, it might not make sense. So our goal is to partner with visiting uh, organizations coming into town to show them ways of saving money as well as be socially responsible to our uh, community here. So that's what we do is uh, we uh, enable visiting uh, convention and, and visitors to uh, be responsible to their, to their impact and uh, provide that in a way that really um, saves them money as well as could provide them a source of income. So benefiting the uh, cooperative extension as well as um, over 300 community programs we've worked with in the last three years and uh, directly have impacted over 75,000 uh, individuals throughout Southern Nevada. How long have you been doing this, Zachary? Um, August, August of 07 is when I incorporated. Uh, Pretty new company. Exactly right. Uh, I, I founded this business um, to really provide a standard practice for uh, Las Vegas as we are the leader in the convention industry. I think that as a convention industry, we need a lead in sustainability. You bet. And uh, we, we you know, have invested quite, a, quite an extensive amount for our community into this industry and uh, this industry can really pull us back out of our economic downturn. That's, you have a higher purpose, that's, uh, that's pretty neat. I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, rebrand Las Vegas, if you yeah, will, I to uh, the sustainable uh, destination for business. And how did you find this repurpose America? How did you, They how actually did you found us. They heard that we were doing a conference because you're on a conference list when you've got an upcoming conference and they contacted us 
and it was almost like being a kid in a candy mm -hmm. store or something when with all the bounty and they've continued to support cooperative extension and the horticulture department um, the recent landscape show and everything I wasn't kidding about the pink flamingos we have pink flamingos that we're thinking we might be using it when we do different classes to be able to say okay kids go to the pink flamingo you know garden or something like that um, potting soil fertilizers uh, for our own conference, we use things like foam core to hang our poster sessions on. Uh, we had badge and holders. And those are materials that, that could come from your Everything. company. That's exactly right. So a lot of these materials, as she mentioned, are non-recyclable. So as uh, our mission is to enable a sustainable community through innovation and education, uh, what we do is we complement and complete the recycling process by diverting those non-recyclables. So it actually saves money and time for the recycling company because they're not sorting through those materials. Let's well, saves our landfill because those materials ultimately have no destination. And so ultimately that in turn saves uh, organizations such as the Cooperative Extension money um, because our, our, our goal is really to uh, impact the community and uh, from everybody I meet from the Cooperative Extension it's, it's uh, just really impressive how much they do for the community and how much education is really um, at our fingertips with them. Every person I meet is just uh, so passionate and, and encouraged by what they do every day and I think that's um, a blessing for our community um, because we need people like that to encourage our, our children and that's really what it's about is uh, giving them the tools to um, overcome budget constraints as well as the tools to educate. And what a great message to be productive and green at the same time and green in a different way than the recycling. That's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting concept to, to do that and I suspect you're going to continue uh, this Master relationship uh, uh, yeah. together. It's a perfect relationship. Master gardeners are by nature recyclers, and uh, absolutely, it's been beneficial. And well, fun. and I think nothing nothing impacts you more as far as sustainability than food, um, and having that outlet or that that inlet for education is really um, impacting. And um, our our approach in our organization is a top down, bottom up approach. So we work to educate our children that are young. And then we work with college students such as UNLV and CS, CCSN to educate and them. And UNR. And UNR, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> Always absolutely, UNR. absolutely. And so it's, it's, um, it's imperative that we um, em empower our, our youth because um, right now we're in a time where we have to rethink and, and reevaluate what's a priority. Well, it sounds like a, a, a good match between the two. I hope it is uh, that it goes yeah, on <laughs> long and fruitfully. And uh, thank you both for talking to us about it today. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension Connection. Uh, my next guest is Ann Ball. She's with the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension also and is program coordin coordinator for the STOP Hypertension Program. Um, hypertension, high blood pressure, yes. that, uh, that kind of thing. What exactly is your program about? Well, the name is Eating to Stop and Control High Blood Pressure. It is a program developed by the with the University of Nevada Corporate of Extension. And it is a program that is absolutely free to the community. Um, it is a program that is designed to do just what the program, what the name says, to stop and control high blood pressure. Now is this a program to um, identify different medications that I should be taking to control hypertension? Or do you take a different tack? Uh, we absolutely do. It's about uh, how we eat and the program um, is set up with a program, an eating program called DASH. The DASH diet, um, D-A-S-H stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. It has nothing to do with medication, it's about how we eat. And so um, the food that we eat makes a difference and so we teach how to follow that program. Now the old standby that we all tried to avoid was salt. Uh, I've been hearing that. I have a little hypertension myself okay. and I've been hearing cut out the salts most of my adult life. Is that, Absol or is there more than that? Absolutely correct. The research has shown that when we eat a diet or an eating plan that is low in fat, low in sodium, and high with fruits, 
vegetables and grains that it can reduce a blood pressure for a person whether you have high blood pressure or not and uh, that's well, what even you're if you're by. not even in if a you're chronic in a situation with high blood pressure this will improve absolutely your blood pressure. for a person with or without you will get a better blood pressure reading by following this plan and are there um, dietitians involved in this? Is that sort of at the fundamentals of the program to develop the, the, the kind of foods that people should be eating? No, actually the, the, the plan is already researched through the researchers and we just teach this, getting people to understand that a well-balanced eating plan is what's gonna help control the blood pressure because the DASH plan is already set where you only have about 27% of the calories uh, come from fat and it's absolutely low sodium because we teach herbs and spices to enhance the flavor rather than to add all of the salt. Well that flies in the face <coughs> of the old adage that if it tastes good spit it out. So you're <laughs> saying it can taste good and you can it, go ahead and eat it. Absolutely yes you can eat it um, with the herbs and spices that we teach you. Is there a, um, is there a, a physical component to this? Do you encourage people to be more active uh, and that sort of thing as well? Well, the, the thing is, is that uh, high blood pressure is a serious chronic disease and it affects all Americans and the issue is t um, recognizing that today there are 73 million people, one in three adults, that's affected with high blood pressure. So we talk to them about coming to our classes because we know that if they come to our classes, the information that we're gonna share is gonna help reduce those risk factors. What are those risk factors? Being overweight, that's lack me. of physical activity. That's me. Lack of physical activity, I, I don't wanna join you when you say that's you. <laughs> <laughs> but lack of physical activity as well, and then over abuse of alcohol, and then of course, some people that are very sensitive to high blood pressure are African Americans. And so um, we share this information because we want to reach the broad population. Everybody is affected in one way or another can be with this um, chronic disease. In my own experience, I've learned that blood pressure, high blood pressure uh, is kind of without symptom. I can't feel that I have high blood pressure. I have to get that reading on my mm -hmm. arm to know that I have it. Uh, and mm -hmm. so it's not one of those things of, of you feel some pain or dizziness or whatever you could feel quite normal. Absolutely. And the thing about that is it's called the silent killer because there are no symptoms. And so we try to get people to understand behavior first, behavior modification look at what you're eating, change your eating habits, and get them to understand not to beat upon themselves because behaviors are not something that's gonna change overnight, but over time, if you learn the proper way of eating, you are going to be able to affect those changes. And it starts young, doesn't it? it to get starts. us all in the habit of eating the right way. Um, that's exactly correct. I was just trained to eat whatever was on the table, and, and if I took it, I was to eat it, and I've fought that my whole life of trying to be a little smaller person. That's, and, and that is correct, because even though we may have all of this on our plates to eat, we still need to look at how it's prepared. Yes. And you can eat a good balance of food if it's prepared correctly, not to fried all the time, not the heavy salt, adding the salt at the table, just recognizing that we can eat a healthier meal without all of the additives that cause us either to gain weight or to cause the blood pressure to be aggravated. How do I become a part of your curriculum? How do I become one of your students? Well, actually, uh, one of the things that we've done after we newly revised our, our curriculum, we started out teaching in the churches, so a lot of churches have our information. You can also go to our website, um, um, UNR, dot unce um, dot edu. Dot edu thank yes, you yes yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes um, our website and then through community centers uh, recreation centers we're all out there in the community teaching our programs and all I need to do is commit to a certain amount of training to be a part of your class how much training do I have to agree to our lessons are five weeks and we ask that our participants commit to that one day a week for five weeks and it's one hour.
spend an hour together once a week once for a five week. weeks and maybe have some impact on Absolutely. my chronic high blood pressure. It will have an impact upon your blood pressure. Give me pressure. a longer life. Uh, yes, that's our hope. What a nice you. goal that is. <laughs> and how do you know if, if people are improving as a result of what they've learned? Do you get feedback? Is there an evaluation? Yes, that we do. We have an evaluation after each uh, class. But more than that, um, the research is being uh, analyzed at this time. We do not have a report back as of yet, but we have got many of our participants that send letters to us about how the uh, program has impacted their lives. And then our site coordinators give us verbal feedback on what the participants are saying to them and how it's impacted them. So we then learn what works and what doesn't and keep making our program better. Ann Ball, thank that you very correct. kindly for talking to us about hypertension today. This is a very important subject uh, and you. we will be right back. Welcome back to the Extension Connection. Uh, I'm Jerry Buck, your host, and my guest is Ricky Gorier uh, with Cooperative Extension, University of Nevada Cooperative Extension, and Ricky is the Mini Society Program Coordinator. Yes, sir. Mini Society, as I understand, is a kind of a national program, and in the Las Vegas Valley, you run it. I do, I do. Uh, Mini Society is, it's been adapted for the for the Vegas audience. Um, we've incorporated it so that we can deliver the program in the school district um, during the school day. It's an experience-based, hands-on learning program for kids between the ages of 10 and 12, more specifically fifth graders in elementary schools. Fifth graders, elementary schools, and many society exposes them to the world of business, so the world of entrepreneurism. Is, is that the focus of this? It is. Uh, research shows that youth are more acceptable to the entrepreneurial spirit between the ages of 10 and 12. And with the economy that we have now, it's more important that we engage these youth at a young age so that when they get to the workforce, they'll be more primed and ready to, to venture out into that entrepreneurial segment of the market. And once you've learned to take that risk and feel those highs of a little business success, your hope is, I suspect, they will become lifelong entrepreneurs. That, that is the hope, that is the hope. How many kids are you uh, focused on in the, the Vegas Valley? How many have had a chance to experience this? Um, I believe 6,000 youth um, over 6, the life 000. of the program so far have experienced it in the Las Vegas Valley. And the people who are teaching the program, how many? One. One. One at a time. I see, <laughs> and I suspect you being the one uh, you're working in the grade schools or in the primary schools around the valley. Uh, have you had an opportunity yet to work out in the outlying communities or is it pretty focused on the, the urban population? It's uh, pretty focused on the urban population. Uh, we go to schools that usually have a, a high rate of student with free or reduced lunch, um, high minority populations, schools that um, have the risk, uh, at-risk schools that have the need for a program like this to engage the youth and not only help them and give them the experience of the entrepreneurial program, but help them make better decisions and engage in teamwork and leadership. So if the, the kids are, are, are engaged in this program, is it by volunteerism on their part, they choose to be a part of it, or is this incorporated into their um, curriculum in school? It's a little bit of both. Uh, the program is based on benchmarks set by CCSD, but the way we've set up the program, we've set it up in such a manner to engage the kids. Uh, there are certain types of rewards that we give the kids that it, it captures them from the beginning, which allows them to go through the process, the five steps of the program, and stay engaged and learn throughout the program while they're having a good time doing it. And is there any part of this that is kind of hands-on? Um, are there examples? How do, the, how do the kids go through the curriculum? Uh, it, it, what is the experience? Okay, well, there are five stages to the program. Each stage is experience-based and hands-on for the participants. Um, the first stage is the introduction. We go through and we introduce the program. Uh, I introduce myself. We introduce them to the element of scarcity and how important it is and how relevant it is to the kids throughout life uh, between natural resources, human resources, and everything else. And we engage them. We get them captive. 
Uh, from there, we move on to the second part of the program, which is the forming of the society. Each classroom becomes their own society. And this society, they name it, they create their own flag, they create their own currency, which allows them to buy in and have ownership of their society. Then they become proud of their society as opposed to the other societies in the school. Now that's where this is becoming a mini society. That's where it's becoming. It's created a by the students. Correct. And it's complete buy-in and we still have the kids engaged. So then we move on to the third part of the program, which is the jobs portion of it. There are different jobs in the society that the youth can get, but to get the jobs, they have to go through an interview and they have to fill out an application. At this point in their lives, they've never had this opportunity. They've never had to do anything like this. And a lot of youth, when they get to high school and are ready to enter the workforce, still have not gone through right. an interview or filled out an application. So we give them this experience and the rewards is they get paid. So they're motivated and still engaged. Uh, the fourth part of the program is the business and they form their own businesses. They're allowed to form partnerships or do it by themselves as a sole proprietor. And they have to do a business plan, a business license. They have to market it. They have to advertise it. They have to do a cost analysis. Everything from when they buy the raw materials to they till the day that they sell it to their customers at the international market. These are fifth graders. These are fifth graders. That are building business plans, developing marketing strategies. And shooting commercials. And shooting commercials on how to sell their product. Yes, sir. And then the fifth stage, which is the big buildup for the program, is the international market. And the international market is all of the fifth graders come together and they set up shop, whether we do it in a multi-purpose room, the cafeteria, or outside. And they set up shop against every other fifth grader competing for the business that the third and fourth graders will bring to them. The third and fourth graders are then provided with a certain amount of money, depending on the school and the number of kids. We give them so much money to go shopping and buy whatever they want from whoever they want. Um, at the international market, there are items such as food. A lot of kids do cupcakes, rice kids, recipe treats, um, nachos. We are, we are, as you're talking, we're showing some video. Of oh, this fantastic. Right now. Um, there'll be crafts such as bookmarks, um, origami. Um, there'll be pro uh, services such as um, face painting, a nail painting, and then there'll also be games that they can play, whether it's football toss, soccer kick, or whatever. And the kids have to figure out what do they think the third and fourth graders would want to buy compared to what the other kids are selling. So your role then in this process, you must be sort of facilitating the conversation. It sounds like the kids are pretty much in charge of creating the society that best suits them, um, experimenting with success, and, and then is your role to just sort of guide them through the process? I give them the parameters and let them go from there. Um, we, we explain opportunity costs and what is the opportunity of you choosing this business over this business. And I always tell the kids, I will let you sell this product if you want to. If you have a good plan, you can sell this product. But if you were a third and fourth grader, would you want to buy this if you were sitting next to a business that was selling cupcakes or football toss or origami? Would you want to buy something that you could go home and do yourself or something that you couldn't? You try to insert some reality uh, right. into, into the experience. Yes. A third and fourth grader as your uh, consumer. Interesting. Yes, yes it is. Uh, where do you see this program going? Uh, how will you know if the kids, you, you said 6,000 fifth graders have been a part of this program. Um, will it be 20,000 in the valley? Uh, will, it, uh, will these kids move on to become entrepreneurs as adults? And if they do, how will you know that? We, we do hope that we've planted the seed of entre the entrepreneurial spirit in the youth. It's hard to track them because of the transient nature of the valley. Um, not all kids in fifth grade at this school will go to the same junior high school and high school and from there. But there are some examples of youth that have gone through the program that have gone on to start their own business. Now, it's still on the small scale, but the examples that we do have um, one individual was selling jewelry at the main society and now they do custom jewelry, um, not gold or silver, but custom jewelry and um, the product is made out of materials such as string and beads and whatnot for individuals and making real money for it. So she has her own business and it was all based around what she learned in the main society. 
an entrepreneur is uh, is kind of a um, a, a business opportunist. Is, is that how you would uh, kind of uh, easily define what an entrepreneur is? Yes, definitely. And with the market and the way Vegas is, with so many people in the past relying on gaming and the lack of um, higher education to be successful, they could leave high school and go get a job parking cars and make $100,000 a year. But with the economy being the way it is and the lack of jobs, we need more of the entrepreneurial spirit. And hopefully this program has instilled in some of the 6,000 youth that have been through it to step out on their own and take a chance and be successful in their own right. Do you know if there's a uh, entrepreneurial graduate degree at either UNLV or UNR? Do we have such a thing here? I do not think so. Um, I'm familiar with the business program, but not a not major in entrepreneurialism is is not available yeah, as far as you know. I do not believe so. Well, it would certainly be worth. Uh, creating, you, it sounds like you've created a, a potential stream of, of students to go on to higher education and develop, refine those skills in entrepreneurism. Uh, I, would, I would think that would be a, a marvelous uh, track for these kids to go on to. I would hope so. I would definitely hope so. Where do you, uh, where do you see yourself in the next few years? Is this, uh, is this your vision for, uh, for yourself, is to help these kids move on? Well, my name is hard to pronounce. I'm Mr. G because they, they have a hard time pronouncing Gurrier. So when I receive my doctorate next year and I'm Dr. G, we'll, uh, we'll see where it goes That'll be there. better. We'll, well see where it goes. I can say it. And Dr. G in the future, yeah. thank you very much for spending this time with us to talk about the mini society. And thank you for spending the last half hour with us on Extension Connection.